Hello, welcome to the TFO Football Podcast. Joe is not here. Something loud is happening outside his house, which means that we weren't able to have him on the podcast. If we would have done, you wouldn't have been able to hear anything we've spoken about. Um, but Alex is here. Alex, what do we talk about? Uh, today we are going to cast our eye over Fulham, West Ham, Arsenal and Spurs, mostly. So it's a bit London-centric, but we do talk about other teams as well. Um, just kind of working out where they are at the moment and what they're up to. Yeah, it does feel like uh, a few more themes are revealing themselves. And it is a really strange season, so it's very, very difficult to, to kind of um, to pinpoint like permanent issues and sides. But it does feel like a couple of them are revealing themselves. Yeah, I'd say that's fair. Okay, well, we are in danger of being late for our design meeting. So we are just going to get straight to it. Hope you enjoy it. <laughs> start with Fulham. Let's indeed start with Fulham because Fulham are weird. Fulham Fulham go through periods during games where they look absolutely atrocious and then as per the weekend all of a sudden something seems to click. What are you seeing from them? I'm seeing something slightly weird yes. I mean I think it's I think it's an interesting parallel with Norwich from last season in that you have a team that comes up from the championship playing you know attractive quick passing football. One of the things I I noticed about Fulham is that that when they're passing the ball, they're always looking to pass it slightly in front of the man to to generate that momentum. And you know they put together some quite nice moves, but there are massive flaws within the way they do that. So there are errors passing out from the back. They they give the ball away too easily in in dangerous areas, particularly kind of low wide spaces. I, I'm not sure that they quite have enough guile. And, and penetration out wide right with Cavaliero. I, I'm not quite seeing what, what he's supposed to be doing. But there is also, there's something really nice about the way they play football when it clicks. I, I just worry that, that an adherence to that system, and I suppose more importantly that style, is is going to cost them because they, they certainly looked better once Mitrovic was on, once Loftus-Cheek was on, and they were being a little bit less pretty, maybe, and, and trying to be a little bit more effective. I'm going to go back to that point about passing out from the back, because what is strange to me is that in some ways, Fulham appear to have made all of the same mistakes they did last time, just to a lower scale. So uh, the the back five who began the game against Everton are all new players. So and uh, Anderson and Arda Rabio in the centre. Uh, Ola Aina um, and Anthony Robinson at fullback. And obviously the goalkeeper is new too. It makes me feel nervous when teams do this because if you're going to if you're going to move the ball forward, if you're going to move the ball forward in increments, you need continuity and you need chemistry. And when you come up a division, like replacing a big chunk of your side is is a risk under the best of circumstances. To do it here and to also, I mean, I I know Anguissa uh, has been at the club before and went out on loan, but Anguissa is essentially uh, he's embedding back into the squad. Lamina is a new player, so it's not really a front, a, a back five, which is new. It's a back seven. And it's just, it's a, maybe this is why they kind of play in these pulses, is because that kind of understanding just doesn't exist across 90 minutes yet. It's really strange. Yeah, so I, I did a piece for The Athletic uh, last week on West Ham. And in the course of that, I looked at basically wh- which teams had been the most consistent in their selections. And the only team that had not, had one lineup that was with any continuity was Fulham. So they've played they've played nine matches. None of their players have played in all nine matches. They've they've got Ariola and Kearney who've both appeared in eight, and they've got Mitrovic and Anguissa who've appeared in seven of the nine. But otherwise, they are all over the place. Um, they've used twenty four players, which is the third most in the league, and I, and I think that's instructive too. If they'd if they'd used easily the most, it would kind of make sense. But they've not, you know. They've used twenty four players, and even within that fact, they still haven't achieved any kind of consistency in selection. So it does make it incredibly hard for them to be able to build those kinds of patterns. I mean, any any football tactic requires understanding. Of course, it does. You know, whether you're playing 
a very, very direct long ball 4-4-2. You know, the players still need to know their roles and, and how they move in relation to one another. But I think it's particularly egregious if you are playing that style of football and you're a newly promoted team and that that particularly the continuity between the back four or back five, as you said, and, and the, the two central midfielders, if you're changing those players all the time, then how are they supposed to to know what to do and how to understand where to move in relation to one another. Well, right, right. And also, it's not actually about the individual players either, in my mind, because I quite like a lot of these players. I think is a good player. I like Lamina. Anthony Robinson's quite a good player. I still don't really feel like I've got a handle on what he is yet. I like the two centre-halves and I like the goalkeeper. It's just the idea of trying to knit together this this side on the fly in the middle of not just a, a, an ordinary Premier League season, but one which is so strange and one where... Uh, fixed digit congestion at it is at its highest and time on the training ground is at a premium. It's it's so counterintuitive. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to me. I mean it's interesting. Anthony Robinson was was heavily linked with Sheffield United um in the summer and United I think felt that they, you know, were pretty much had that deal over the line and then Fulham came in with with a significantly higher offer. And and particularly in that battle that he had with Iwobi on on Fulham's left-hand side, Everton's right, you could see that Robinson, it would be a very effective wing-back going forwards. But defensively, I mean, Iwobi gave him a torrid time in that kind of weird advanced wing-back role that, that he was playing. I, th- I thought that was, you know, from Ancelotti, that was, a, that was a very interesting tactical move where Iwobi is not a wing-back, but he was able to do just enough defensively and obviously... He had Godfrey be- behind him, who is a particularly mobile centre back who has played as a right back as well. So that that kind of compensated for it. But Iwobi's ability to carry the ball forwards, put Fulham really on the back foot on that right hand side and into the right half space, was was something that I think Fulham never really got to grips with throughout the course of that game. And that worries me because on any list of the most dangerous right sided players in the league, Alex Iwobi is not going to feature. Like if you're, <laughs> um, with the greatest respect, if you're if you're having difficulty with Iwobi then you've got um, some fairly unpleasant days ahead. Yeah, I mean, Iwobi's an awkward player. I, I I saw him... He's okay. He's quite a good player. Yeah, he's he... just, he's not like, if you were to put him up against, I don't know, I mean, well, pretty much anyone in the top six, obviously, uh, the notional top six, not, not as it is at the moment, um, you know, but anyone with a bit of pace or, uh, you know, a direct threat, I, I I worry about that part of Fulham's side. Yeah, and obviously with a with a double pivot in midfield, you've got, you know, it, it's there's a real onus on the, the players in that double pivot to cover across in, into the wide spaces, particularly if if Fulham are looking to try and leave somebody a little bit higher for a, for a counter attack, and you know they they don't they don't want the the, the left sided winger. To, to be tracking back constantly and doubling up with the fullback. So then you're looking at, at I think Harrison Reed was was the starting um, midfielder on, on that side uh, uh, with Lamina, who is, I mean, Lamina's not really a defensive midfielder. He's, you know, he's one of these sort of press-breaking um, type of midfielders. So they didn't offer enough cover either. Um, and it just yes, it looked it looked disjointed for a lot of particularly that first half. Let's stop treading on Fulham because actually I think that at some point uh, one of the things that's becoming clear this season is that you're not gonna get uh, you're not gonna get teams that fall adrift. I don't think because um, the quality at the bottom of the division is quite poor at the moment, or that the sort of the 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 ability to um, the ability to pick up points is uh, quite precious. So I think you can probably get away with having the kind of start that Fulham have had, West Brom have had, Sheffield United have had, uh, Burnley have had, a couple of wins and it takes you out of it. And so I wouldn't be surprised if at some point um, the quality does gel. I just think it's, um, I don't know, uh, yeah. it's it's taking a mighty I risk. I think it's also just worth noting quickly with Fulham that you know their, their expected goals against is just under 14 uh, and they've conceded 18. So there's, there's quite a disparity there, more so than there is, say, with, with West Brom or Sheffield United that are below them. And you do kind of think that that maybe there's, you know, certainly on the defensive side, there'll be a little bit more of a regression and, and they might tighten up and, and not let quite so many of, of those ones in. Um, and, and that's a benefit. But 
I think that the, the main issue with Fulham is if they don't start with Mitrovic up front, it's hard to see where goals are going to come from because I think um, Cordova Reed is is an interesting mobile player, but certainly my experience of him before that game was was kind of as a quite an aggressive eight or possibly a ten. You know, he's not really somebody I would want as a striker in a Premier League side. No, I think, I mean, I saw a bit of Bobby Reid when he was at Bristol City. To me, he is, he's at his best at that level, certainly as a kind of second forward. He's a good ball carrier, he's mobile, he's a good footballer. I think actually he exists somewhere between the Premier League and the Championship. Not quite good enough for one, probably too good for the other. Or, you know, certainly currently, um, he doesn't seem to have ever established any real confidence in the Premier League. He's a he's a good technical player and, you know, in the right system, he could be very, very useful, I, I think. I hope. He, he would make sense playing off Mitrovic, yep. but then Fulham seemed relatively wedded to having Tom Kearney in, in the 10 role. So, um, I mean, albeit quite a deep setting 10. So I'm not I'm not quite sure how that all works out for them. But that's that's something they'll have to solve. Let us move on to something which is making a bit more sense at the moment and which is going far better than anybody expected. West Ham, you talked about the piece that you wrote. What was in there? And where can people find it, importantly? Let's let's put a plug in there. Well, funnily enough, Seb, they can find it on The Athletic. Oh, that's that's um, very handy. <laughs> yeah, weird. I know. And if someone wanted to go to The Athletic and wanted to take advantage maybe of some kind of deal, where could they do that, Alex? Yes, that, that would be theathletic.com forward slash TIFO where there will be a deal on, I don't currently know what it is because... Hey, Matt, it's like it's like a lucky dip. There's always a deal and it's always a good one. So in many ways, it doesn't really matter that we haven't looked up specifically what that deal is. Um, in many ways, it makes it more exciting for you to you know to just go in and see what the deal is. So yeah, go and do that and read Alex, Alex's piece. First though, Alex, tee us up. Tell us about that piece. What's actually going well at West Ham at the moment? The honest answer is most things... So West Ham have always had this issue for for the last sort of 10 or so years of poor recruitment, spending too much money, not buying in the right players. Um, I think you described it many, many podcasts ago as basically getting the best person available for the least money, irrespective of how they fit in. And, and that did seem to be kind of a governing dynamic for them. As Moyes has clearly got more of a handle on the transfers, he is bringing in Moyes type players, you know, people like Kufal, people like Sushek, who are going to do a good job, but are kind of determined, scrappy, professional, not necessarily big names, but prepared to roll up their sleeves and all of those kinds of cliches. So West Ham have now got more of an edge than they had before. They still do have a bit of quality. So, you know, Fornals is a good creative player. Jared Bowen is great at making those late runs. Cresswell has a good range of passing. But what Moyes has done is he's he's shifted into a really weirdly passive 3-4-3. So I saw a, a, a graph on Twitter yesterday, I think, where basically if you rank teams by how much they press, West Ham are right towards the bottom end of that list. But they're the only team in the sort of bottom half of that list who have a positive XG difference. Everybody else is kind of under the cosh if they're not pressing. But West Ham have this way of, rather than being particularly aggressive or dynamic in terms of how they defend, they control space really intelligently. So they fall back into a 5-4-1, they, they shift from side to side, but they are, they're putting up a barrier. They're not aggressively hunting the ball. They're much more interested in repelling the opposition by making themselves impossible to play through and asking the opposition to, to find... Uh, you know, an answer to that rather than hunting them down and trying to win the ball back all the time. Uh, and that makes them incredibly difficult to break down. You know, you know what they remind me of? The, you know that scene in Gladiator where, like, they're, they're all being attacked by uh, the guy on horseback and uh, Maximus has them sort of packed into that single column where they all put their shields yeah. up? That's like West Ham, in a way. That, that is very much like West Ham because what they, what they want to do is they want to invite the opposition onto them and then win the ball back quite deep and then use Cresswell's passing or Masuaku's pace to get the ball forwards and, and basically catch the opposition out. When I wrote the article, there were some really intelligent comments from athletic readers and, and there was a persistent theme of, this is great, but how are we going to do against teams that want to 
you know, want us to break them down rather than the other way around. And I think that will be possibly more of a test for West Ham when, when they start coming against teams that are that are prepared to let them have the ball and see what they do. But but certainly in terms of establishing a really, really solid defensive base, I mean, Balbuena's been excellent, Ogbonna's been good, Cresswell's worked very, very well on that left sided centre back space, even though he's you know, he's not very tall. He's not you know an aerial defender but he's intelligent enough positionally to cover that and he brings that range of passing and and West Ham have you know last season they attacked down the left hand side as well but they've they've found a shape that allows them to have their two most dynamic left sided players both on the pitch at the same time which is really smart that also frees Declan Rice up to be a little bit more progressive, as does Sushek. And I think Rice in the West Ham side is a really good player. I don't see that he's being used as well as he could be for England. But if you watch him for West Ham, it's like a different person. So it's, you know, it, it's it's just really good, solid coaching of, you know, this is how we're going to play. This is going to be the system. It's not going to change very much. These are your roles. These are your functions. And now we practice, practice, practice. Uh, and and that's what Moyes does. You know, he establishes teams that are hard to break down. Where there's one or two players who are, uh, you know, who have game changing creativity, but they're mostly carried by the the work ethic and the organisation of everyone else. I feel like recruitment is always going to be key at West Ham. So you mentioned it there, and this is this this is going to light the path forward because I always worry with West Ham that with a bit of positive momentum all of a sudden sort of decision makers within the organisation are going to become um, overly emboldened and start to have a little bit too much faith in their own acumen. Um, <laughs> and yes, what you get in David Moyes. Actually, there's a really good chapter in um, Living on the Volcano, um, Mike Halvin's book. Fantastic, uh, fantastic read for anyone who hasn't read it. I, I think he, he, he goes into uh, David Moyes' kind of recruitment room when Moyes isn't there and he's shown around by a, an Everton member of staff. And the way he handles recruitment and the way he isolates what he needs in a team, this is back in the Everton days, of course, is very smart. Whereas West Ham in the past, it's always been so ad hoc. You mentioned at the beginning where I always felt like, who's the biggest billboard we can buy every summer? Who's the player that can convince everybody that we're a big team? And that was West Ham's mistake for a really long time, was trying to make the, the quantum leap between where they were and where they wanted to be. Whereas someone like Moyes is someone that's always going to underwrite you know, incremental progress. It's going to be right. We're going to we're going to have the right back who's a little bit like Tony Hibbert here. We're going to have the slightly Fellaini-ish midfielder in Sushek there. You know, these are players who they're not going to they're not going to change your commercial profile. They're not going to change necessarily the way people think about the team, but they are going to make you a better side. And I think the kind of the 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 important conflict here is well, the important issue is that Moyes is allowed to install that vision. That it doesn't become a situation where with this new solid base, all of a sudden, you know, some, you know, some player who's washing out of Juventus, who's available for only like 180 grand a week or something, one of those. You got to make sure that that doesn't become, that we don't kind of revert to type, that it isn't sort of, we've got a blank check and we want to spend it. You got to make sure that mentality stays away from this squad. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I think what, you know, Moyes first and foremost is a proper squad builder in the sense that that he he puts together teams where it feels like most, if not all, of those players have a similar kind of outlook on how the game should be approached. And there's a kind of a grittiness to that. And, you know, that West Ham team that he put together, yes, there were there were people like Pinar who who could carry the ball and, and do exciting things. But the the vast majority of them, they weren't showy. You know, there's nothing showy about a good David Moyes team. The problem is that the sorts of transfers that, that West Ham seem to like to go for are showy transfers. And, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I, I'm disappointed, for example, that they let Ajeti go up to, to Celtic. I think, you know, there's a really good player there. But I think importantly, there's a player there who is a bit of a bastard, you know, who has a, has a kind of nasty edge to him. Uh, and I don't mean that pejoratively. I, I think that's a quality in a in a striker. But you know, somebody who's prepared to press hard or to make themselves awkward or to to chase down balls in the channels, that kind of stuff. And the less West Ham think, you know, we need to find that that luxury creative player that will 
make us look a little bit sexier. Moyes doesn't do sexy. And I don't mean that in a in a bad way. It's just, you know, it's it sounds not... like you haven't seen that photo of him getting out of the shower. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not, you know, it's just it's not it's not what he is particularly adept at coaching. But I think I think the issue is that is when people see that as being by default a bad thing. And it's yep. not a bad thing. West Ham, you know, they're in eighth currently. Um, they've they've got a, a good strong defensive record. Um, you know, they they've conceded the joint fewest goals in the league. Oh, apart from Tottenham, actually, they've conceded one fewer. So second joint fewest goals in the league. And that's not only without a team that doesn't really have many star players. I mean, arguably Declan Rice is kind of the the biggest name in that squad, uh, and he's a defensive midfielder. But it's also a squad that, let's not forget, you know, a lot of us said at the beginning of the season, these guys are really going to struggle. And I, and I think if you looked at, at how they went last season and the, the frailties of the 4-2-3-1, that was a perfectly legitimate call. What Moyes has done is he's changed the system dramatically and all of a sudden it's a much, much stronger team and he should just be left to get on with that. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. OK, let's, um, let's take a short break and we're going to come back and talk about Arsenal. Hello, I'm Ian McIntosh, and despite literally spending months of my life playing football manager, I'm still terrible at it. That's why I'm launching The Football Manager Show, the latest podcast from The Athletic. Every week, I'll speak to the people who know the game best, the people who make the game. We'll take a proper look at things like training, recruitment and tactics. We'll try to answer your questions. We'll do everything we can to keep you eager to play just one more game and altogether less inclined to quit without saving. The era of Cherno and Tonton and dear sweet Michael Duff is over. The new football manager is bigger, better, more challenging than ever. And I need some help. If you do too, you can subscribe now. Just look for the Football Manager Show by The Athletic, wherever you get all your other podcasts. It starts in November, and knowing my track record, I'll be okay, here we are again. Um, before we get to Arsenal, I, just, I, I want to address something because it just infuriates me. So the Pepe incident on Sunday, the um, quote-unquote headbutt, we had a discussion about what <laughs> constitutes a headbutt over WhatsApp, Alex. Um, I, I say there's you know not enough headbutting in football anymore, really. You know, it's some sort of <laughs> the kind of uh, Fastina Aspria moments, the Roy Keane moments. On a serious note, though, like I'm dismayed by how regularly a player who lets his side down gets racially abused. Yes. I don't want to come across as one of those people that, that says, you know, it was better in my day or whatever, um, because I'm quite certain that it wasn't. But this seems to happen every time, almost to the point where I remember watching the VOR review, seeing the incident, knowing the red card was coming, and also knowing that by the end of Sunday, we were going to have reports of lots of people uh, racially abusing uh, Nicola Pepe across his various social media accounts. I don't even really know what to say about it. I just I want people to do that just out of the game. Do, do, do you understand what I mean? It, it feels like a, I, I can't even diagnose it properly. It revolts me, actually. And I don't know where it comes from other than, you know, people being racist. I think in part it comes from people being racist. I also think to a degree that with social media and with the way that fan tensions are inflamed with not just Twitter, but also, you know, certain fan channels on YouTube that have made fan aggression a centre point of their offering. It, it creates a very febrile atmosphere. And Without question. Without question, yeah. When some fans, and I'm sure some fans are genuinely racist, and obviously we want them to, to be out, but I, I, think, I think some fans also reach for what they feel to be the most offensive way of insulting somebody and that's just as bad and what i'm saying i suppose is that racist abuse is racist abuse whatever the intention is but i think sometimes people are doing it because because they know full well that it is the most disgusting thing that you can say to a player of color and it doesn't necessarily mean that they okay, are uh, inherently it feels, it feels contrived, a racist doesn't person it? but the way that things have been escalated and stoked and made so unpleasant means that that's what they reach to. And that if, if anything, actually, that's almost worse because it, it turns it into something so casual that for the person on the receiving end of that, it 
could not be more upsetting or harmful. And it, it, it's just disgusting. I can't get my head around it because it's so, it's just not understandable to me, really. I, I think I'll find what uh, the most dispiriting aspect of this to be is that, um, is how predictable it is. Because you mentioned there um, about sort of how it's used almost as sport by some people on social media channels. It, it feels very contrived. It feels like there are people out there that try and be as offensive as possible for the sake of some kind of weird currency that I don't understand. I, d I don't know if that's right. I'm guessing. I, I, I cheerfully admit that. But that's how it seems. That's how it comes across. That, I think that, that there may be something in that. And, and I, it, it's always incredibly difficult when, when you start getting into intention and the degree to which offense is caused because it's meant or implied or what have you and I'm, I'm not I don't want to go into that but it's it's impossible for me to believe and maybe this is just blind optimism on my part about the society that we live in but it's it's very difficult for me to believe that that all of the people that send racial abuse are in their day-to-day -day life otherwise racist because if that is the case, then Britain has even more of a problem with racism than I'd imagined. And that, maybe that is just me being very naive, but it feels like there's this kind of disconnect as if somehow when you say something on social media, and it, you know, it doesn't have to be racist, it might be homophobic, it might be transphobic, but it, it feels like the online discourse has become so, so febrile and so stretched from reality. And, and that's not just a sports thing, that's an everything thing. That, that this is what's gone to, you know, instead of expressing your displeasure, you know, like Mikhail Arteta did and, and just saying it's unacceptable. It is unacceptable to get sent off in that way. It's really stupid. But the idea that, that you would then think as an Arsenal fan, the way I would wish to express my disapproval of this is to send racist abuse is it's just a jump that I don't understand. I, I, I think that's the problem. It's the quantum leap. It's the it's a refusal just to be disappointed with the fact that a player's made a mistake. Was it a really stupid thing to get sent off for? Uh, absolutely. I don't think anyone would argue with that. I don't think Nicola Pepe would argue about that. Um, but that we seem so quick to go from player makes mistake to player becomes you know, justifiable target of racial abuse. It's, it describes a sickness which I, I, I'm just not very comfortable with, I have to say. I just... Uh, it's it's very sad. It uh, and 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 you have to. I mean, a you worry about the players. You know, obviously, these are people who are being insulted and offended and and attacked, really, because it is an attack. It's not you know, it's not someone being mean. It is an assault. That person is making a conscious decision to deploy a particular insult because it is calculated to cause the most harm. And you know, the the football authorities, the police. And, and society in general have a responsibility to stamp down on it. But, but it's, you know, it's very different. If you're in a stadium and you hear somebody racially abusing a player, you can talk to a steward, you can get them kicked out. If it's on social media, you know, okay, you can report a tweet, but I have very little confidence in Twitter to do very much about that stuff anyway. What else can one do other than, you know, you, you condemn it, you report it, but it feels like something that is out of the engagement of, of most, you know, the vast majority of fans are not like this. But it feels like there's a, a limited amount that we can do. Yeah, right. Well, let's talk about the football because um, Arsenal, Arsenal are quite a... Well, Arsenal are also quite a strange team. Not in, necessarily in the Fulham sense, but I find myself not really understanding what they are or where they are in their sort of journey towards whatever Mikel Arteta wants them to be. Um, in layman's terms, I find them very boring, Alex. I find them really, really dull to watch. They're kind of, um, and it's interesting because obviously uh, you pair anyone with Leeds and that's going to be quite an unflattering comparison in terms of sort of entertainment value. Why are they so mechanical at the moment? I think mechanical is a really good word for it. You know, it's, it's the sort of... It's the clunky bit of positional play before positional play works. So the idea that players need to find themselves in particular zones and be arranged in relationship to where other players are, where the ball is and where the opposition are, and have these kind of rehearsed patterns of approach play is the, the foundation of positional play, which 
is what Pep Guardiola espouses and what Arteta has learned from him. But there are two problems I think that Arsenal have. The first is that Arteta I, I, appears to me doesn't seem to know whether the 3-4-3 or the 4-2-3-1 is the best means of him achieving that with the squad he has at his disposal. And the second is that they still lack somebody who can get the ball frequently and dangerously from you know the top end of the midfield third into the attacking third or the penalty area so you can make patterns and you can look like you know what you're doing in relation to one another but without that either change of gear or the defense splitting pass it ends up looking like it's mechanical because you've got these pre-rehearsed movements but they're not actually ending up in something that produces a moment of attacking play and that, 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 I think, is where Arsenal currently are. Do you think the future lies in the recruitment of a, not an old school number 10, but someone in that, in that kind of role? And if so, like, how are we fitting that player into this side? Well, it depends, doesn't it? It depends on, on whether they want to go for a 4-2-3-1 or a 3-4-3. Yeah. Three, three. And if you're Arteta, you've, you've, got, you've got some significant problems in terms of... So take um, Saka, for example. Saka is a really cool player. Like he is great fun to watch. He does lots of things well. He's interesting. He's energetic. He's dynamic. He's a good passer of the ball. But I don't know where to put him. You know, do do I say, okay, well, he's good enough that we need him as a left wing back, and therefore we're going to play this way. Do we play him as a central midfielder? Do we play him as a left winger? In which case, where does Aubameyang go? He's not that great through the middle. You know. If you were to load up Arsenal on Football Manager 21, you'd see an awful lot of players that occupy the same positions or that have the same sort of positions as their preferred choice. There's a lack of balance in that squad that I think makes it very, very difficult to figure out exactly what you want to do. And I think in terms of central midfield, for example, well, you've got Xhaka, who's actually a good progressive passer of the ball, but from deep situations, you've got Ceballos, who probably works best in a midfield three kind of pushing forwards playing in the half spaces but still isn't quite getting into the box you've got Partey who's a box-to-box midfielder but if you put any arrangement of those and El Nenny actually who's been really impressive as a defensive midfielder as a presser and a ball winner I still don't see the easiest way to balance those guys up together to get what I would ultimately want from Arsenal which is somebody who can move the ball from 10 yards in front of the penalty area into the penalty area. I don't know who's doing that for them. And they, you know, obviously in in this game, they tried it with Willock, but it didn't work. You know, um, Willock is more... I think Willock's a good player. I just don't think he belongs quite that far forward. No, I don't think he does. I, I think, I think Willock's, in my opinion, Willock is the sort of person who, as an eight, adds ball carrying and the ability to break a press but still needs somebody ahead of him to then link that to the forward line. Now, that may just be because Willock's still very young and is developing into somebody who can also spot that pass. I think Willock's a really promising player. But I, I'm unconvinced that this squad has the balance to make it easy for Arteta to stick and not twist. And, and that that's a tricky thing for him to sort out because he's clearly not an enormously flexible coach in terms of the style of football that he wants to play. So if he can't be flexible in that regard, where he has flexibility is then the shape of the team and which players he uses, because we know that they're going to play the same stylistic approach, kind of irrespective of those other two. But there isn't a natural fit between the squad and either of those two um, kind of tactical setups on the pitch. So I yeah, he, he's he's kind of stuck until the next window. Probably not the next window, because I doubt you'd do it in January. But I think he really needs to nail down, like I say, not the approach, but but the, the, the disposition of those players on the pitch. Fundamentally, is it going to be a back four or a back three? Then how are we going to build a midfield and then recruit from that? I'd be interested to see, now that obviously uh, Pepe is going to serve a three-game ban, I imagine it's going to be three games, I'm... So it's not going to be overturned, unfortunately. Um, I'd be interested to see who he uses off that right side because I, I, I too, I like Saka. It took me a while to get him. I wasn't, 
overly impressed with him um, during the kind of his sort of initial Europa League appearances. Um, looked like a good player, but not necessarily one that um, I was particularly excited about. Over time, I think I've changed my opinion because I think what he is is a pretty um, pretty agile player positionally. He's adaptable, playing lots of different roles. I wouldn't hate to see him playing off the right purely because from those wide positions, so within a 4-2-3-1, um, I want players driving in towards the box, specifically to the, into the area uh, just in front of the penalty box, that little corridor. And in Pepe, I see a kind of, I see a little bit of an Eric Lamella. Not in temperament, but in terms of style. He's quite languid in the same way. He's got that sort of, you know, cultured left foot, which doesn't come with any real urgency. And so in Saka, I see someone that's a little bit more penetrative, you know, slightly out of position if you play him in that area, because I think he would probably prefer to be off the left-hand side, um, either from wing-back or as a sort of more advanced player. But I want to see Arsenal creating a few more issues in front of team centre-backs, because at the moment, this lack of creativity means that uh, they're, they're kind of shoveling everything down the flanks and they're becoming a little bit cross heavy too which concerns me because I find that very weird from an Arsenal team like stylistically that's a that's a very strange place for an Arsenal side to be um, and I, I just think it's um, when you have a young player and Willock's in this category Reese Nelson's in this category when you, when you mix a young player with a new young manager who's also growing what you often find is that the manager places a lot more faith in the young player because he's more pliable like he is more willing to adapt his game and to follow instruction. And so I'd like to see sort of, I, I don't really know what to do with the Bamiang. I, I, I mean, I, I take your point. I think he's, he can often be quite underwhelming through the center. But at the same time, it see, it always feels strange to see him out on the left-hand side and removed from the areas of the game where he's most prominent. Like it's it's kind of a no win situation at the moment there because the balance isn't right throughout the rest of the department to use him properly anywhere, and so the other option wherever he's not playing is in the minds of people watching the matches where absolutely he should be playing and where it's unforgivable that he's not being used. But I I, I like Saka. I, I he's that kind of he's got that low center of gravity. He is he's got a quick release on his shot. He makes decisions quickly and he will take players on. I quite want that in that area of the team. Um, it seems to make sense to me. No, I, I think that's right. You know, we we saw against um, we saw for England against the, the Republic of Ireland and against Iceland. You know, his his ability to carry the ball directly, and Arsenal. You know, okay, Pepe is a high volume of dribbler, not massively successful. Um, you know, arguably, probably the best dribbler in the Arsenal squad is is actually Partey, but he's he's carrying the ball you know shorter distances from a deeper position so he's a very different type of dribbler it's a different effect but arsenal arsenal need somebody who is able to you know isolate a defender and go past them and 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 break that kind of mechanistic approach and that's why pepe was selected against leeds um you know of all the teams going against a very high press but man marking orientated system you you would think that would be the game in which pepe would thrive because he could isolate his opposition man and 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 go past them so i think if you look at that then maybe the wing back thing if you've got saka on one side and bayern on the other side they're both decentish ball carriers bayern's decentish that's one way of doing it saka on the right wing cutting inside that also works but then you can't really have Lacazette and Aubameyang both central, which I think might be a reasonably sensible way of of addressing that situation. Lacazette has got so used to dropping off and linking play because of the absence of a creative ten that you know he's not finding himself in shooting positions with any great degree of frequency. And so you kind of think, well, maybe if he's got another striker to play alongside, um, particularly somebody who's a good off the shoulder kind of striker, at least at it sort of drags him towards the opposition goal because he's conscious of where his his fellow striker is rather than constantly coming having having to come deep and roam forage for the ball. So I, I don't like I don't know. It's you know, Arsenal are Arsenal are a real kind of quandary to me in terms of what what the best way for them to set up is and and I think you you know you kind of almost have to pick a part of the team to really nail down. And say, you know, 
whether it's we need player X in position Y and then we go from there, or it's we need a back three or a back four and then we go from there. But that there has to be something that is fixed upon that then informs how everybody else slots around that and then to kind of try and stick with it and, and make it work. Um, and I, I don't quite see that from them yet. No, me neither. Right, well, we'll take a little break and then we'll come back and we will talk about Spurs. Okay, so a little bit of housekeeping before we dive into Spurs Man City. Uh, there is no joint top of the Premier League. There's first and second and there's goal difference. So, sorry, we're just... <laughs> I, I saw that all over all over uh, Twitter um, when Liverpool won their game against Leicester. It's like, no, goal difference, goal difference. Let everyone have their moment. Tottenham are leading the Premier League. Alex, Sorry, who said, who said that they were joint top? No, no, Liverpool were, were joint top of the Premier League. Um, but they're not. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. I mean that's not that's not how tables work. No, exactly. And and I knew I could count on your support for this. As someone that likes data and someone who likes orderly stuff, graphs, tables. You don't even have to like data for that. They're just Tottenham's goal difference is exactly. seven better. That's, that's, that's it. a landslide. <laughs> that's that's absolutely that's not that's not just better goal yeah. difference. That's that's a chasm in goal difference. Right, absolutely. Right. Alex, what do you like about Spurs against Man City? Because I feel like with a, with a sort of nice little symmetry, the same result as obviously the um, the win over Man City back in, I think, late January, late January, early February, something like that. But in terms of a performance, worlds apart, because I covered the uh, the game in the, at the beginning of the year, and that was Spurs just trying to survive. It's like that scene in The Matrix where uh, Keanu Reeves is, is trying to avoid bullets. It's that. Like, it was ridiculous. The, I mean, that, that game should probably finish 4-0, 5-0 to Man City. Um, they were that dominant for the red card. This was this was the most impressive performance of Jose Mourinho's time at the club for me. I felt like there was something to buy into properly. Uh, the goals were well constructed. Everything they did made sense. Pierre Emil Hoiberg's performance was absolutely outstanding. Tangin Domble too. All these little departments worked, and it was incredibly gratifying. What was your take on it? Well, I'm not gratified because I'm not a Spurs fan. But beyond that, yeah, I would agree with with everything that you said. I mean, it's. I think what's interesting about this is that that you know we keep talking about this topsy turvy season, right, where anyone can beat anyone, and unless you're Sheffield United, and the two teams for me, Liverpool aside. Because Liverpool, A, do genuinely have injury issues, but also they, they just have so much quality that they can always kind of be relied upon. To me, the two teams that really seem to have nailed down, the three teams, let's say, that really seem to have nailed down the way they want to play are Tottenham, Southampton and West Ham, who are doing well. And of those, certainly with Tottenham and West Ham, you've got these kind of gnarled, experienced slightly cynical managers in charge and again this is not i'm not being pejorative here but i think i think this season really suits managers who are very very good at setting up a defensive system who are very very good at counter-attacking who work out that certain of the big teams particularly city are a bit fragile on the counter and will try and adhere to a style of play that, that can leave them vulnerable, but don't really know how to adapt to that. And if you can be incredibly organised and resilient defensively, and then have players of the quality of Kane and Song particularly, but also Ndombele's ability to, to break the press, and the assist for the first goal was, was delightful, then you're in with a really, really good shout of, of progressing very, very well. And... Tottenham sit at the top of the Premier League entirely deservedly. There's a structure there, you know, like the little tweaks, like having those central midfielders dropping so, so deep that it was almost like a back six most of the time. That's not a team being under huge amounts of pressure. That's a team going, right, this, this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to draw Man City towards us because we know that in Ndombele is a link player, Kane is a, a number nine but who drops off, and Son with his pace in behind. If we can create that space in front of their back four by inviting them onto us, we will profit from it. That's an attacking move, even though it's putting six people in a defensive line. You know, it's entirely calculated. I'm glad you brought up Ndombele because um, 
I'm I'm writing something about him at the moment, and I'm obviously going through like a lot of footage from this season, not just assists and you know notable moments, but just everything. And one of the things that stands out is this tendency of his to you know when he's receiving the ball, when he's making a tackle, or you know when he's you know pivoting between a couple of players, pirouetting between a couple of players. Nearly always, he seems to end up heading up the pitch. It's really interesting. Like it's a, it's a very subtle difference, but he doesn't, for instance, like you know, Musa Dembele, for example, used to, you know, when he w- would retrieve possession, he would consolidate and he might lay the ball off to a centre-half or a full-back or midfield partner. More often than not, with an Ndombele, like those little moments seem to be accompanied by either a forward pass or a run forward, like at a, at a sort of a south to north run rather than a kind of like um, a lazy kind of lollop generally in the direction of the opposition's goal. And so... I always thought when when Mourinho turned up at the club, I thought if there's one player he's going to absolutely hate, it's Ndombele. I thought he'd get Deli Alli'd. But in actual fact, I feel like there's a little bit of a misunderstanding of Mourinho. Like Mourinho is always presented as as a like a, a negative coach. Like take take his personality out of this for the minute because that's a that's a different issue. Like technically, he's just someone that wants the ball moved up the pitch as as often as possible, as quickly as possible, with as much purpose as possible, and who just doesn't cherish possession in the same way as for instance a Guardiola because he doesn't believe that you can achieve his that you know the kind of the perfection with possession that no team is ever good enough not to make themselves vulnerable if they hold on to the ball for too long um, and so I always thought Ndombele with kind of the sort of the more extravagant parts of his game um, and the risks he takes with the ball in those positions would be sort of it, it's kind of that's his kryptonite isn't it in a way the more I think about it and the more I watch Ndombele's progression and his reconditioning and goodness, watch him press Man City at the weekend. It's amazing to see the transformation in him. But the more I think he's actually perfect for Mourinho because he's, it's not a counterattack. If, you, if you've got the ball in, in sort of the middle third of the pitch, then you're not counterattacking. But in a way, it, he does begin counterattacks because he creates a kind of a quick fracture in the play. He changes the rhythm of a game unexpectedly and very, very quickly. And the, the, the effect, the result, as in when he moves the ball. And I'm thinking, for instance, of uh, that Son goal at Southampton when he dropped his shoulder and roulette between, uh, I think it was Aurel Romeo and James Will Prowse. Like, in a way, that's kind of a counterattack because the effect is the same. You, move, you remove a couple of players quickly from, from the game. You play a pass out to Kane, which leaves you three on three. It has the same effect. And so... I wonder if he's actually the perfect midfielder. Maybe, uh, having spent the last sort of five years assuming that in an ideal world, every mid- Mourinho midfielder would look like Nemanja Matic. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Yeah, I, I think I think the thing that Ndombele Un- does superbly is add verticality to transitions. And that's the sort of slightly wanky thing that, that, that people who uh, analyse football say. But... It, it's what you're talking about. It's the moments when... It's the right phrase for it. I mean, whether people is, like the phrase or not, is, is it describes sure. the right thing, so it's irrelevant. I mean, when, yeah. when the ball is recovered, and, you know, if you've got Hoiberg, who is the king of ball recovery, yeah. that's going to happen quite a lot. Sissoko, again, adding a lot of energy in, in that that double pivot. You know, the, the ball will, will be recovered, it'll come to him, and... And like you say, what he's then looking to do is is burst forwards. And and if you if you go back to the Porto side that Mourinho won the, the Champions League with, there was you know a, an energetic midfield pairing um, who were kind of shuttling, and then Deco ahead. And Deco's job was to carry the ball, to release passes, to to always be playing with his head up, looking forwards to try and release the, the strikers, rather than to be I mean, Deco was actually not a bad defensive or defending midfielder. Well, he was still willing to run during that during the phase of his career when he he sort of yeah exactly he was earning his reputation. Like obviously, latter latter Barcelona era Deco, not the same player, of course, or Chelsea. Deco. No, abs- no, and and he was you know he was more of a kind of still orchestrator there. Yeah. but 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 in in that Mourinho team, the defensive aspects weren't compromised for that ability to receive the ball. And then turn and you know and and they formationally they're not the same team but there's certainly a sense that if you, if you have that solidity in in the double pivot what you need is the person who is then able to create that transition and I think what's great about Ndombélé is we're seeing 
the sort of player who we saw at Lyon that that made him really really exciting. But instead of playing with Toussaint behind and then Hasemoa to one side, it's like he's got two Toussaints, you know. So there's a bit more responsibility on him to be able to to do those things. But they are a much more direct side than Lyon were, and he's able to do that because Kane's dropping off, or there's the long pass over the top to Son or or Bergwijn or Mora if Mora plays. So he doesn't have to do quite so much in terms of, of structured build-up, but he is able to inject that that verticality with really effective results. You know, Tottenham are a pretty efficient team. Like, it's not, you know, they're not having to manufacture huge numbers of attacking opportunities to be able to get one of them to stick because there's, there is a pattern to that play. And I, people talk about Mourinho not being able to coach attacking patterns in the same sort of way. Um, that that some modern managers do, and I, I guess you know it's people like Pep who say that you have to have the ball for fifteen passes to get everyone in exactly the right position before you can attack, which is clearly not true. Um, but there is, you know, that there is a rehearsed quality to the way Spurs counter attack. That the way that Kane drops off, the movement of Ndombele forwards, the timing of the runs in behind, that's not luck or or players kind of extemporizing on the pitch. Like, they know exactly what they're supposed to do. I feel like, Alex, this might be like one of the... I mean, <laughs> watched pretty much every Tottenham counter-attack for the last six months that kind of burnt onto my brain, but there seems to be a couple of imperatives. So what you tend to see with every counter-attacking sequence is Son running at top speed vertically. Kane occupying a position, you know, behind him somewhere, you know, dropping in somewhere to receive the ball, perhaps, or even, you know, leading the the the, the, the counter himself. But then, and this is a really Mourinho-ish quality, like the work rate within the counter seems to be really important. So the most recent example is probably Giovanni Lothelso for Tottenham's second goal. Now, he probably runs about 70, 80 yards and beyond Kevin De Bruyne to get in position to score that goal. And so... You know, Tottenham are kind of manufacturing um, these kind of numerical mismatches. But also, like, it seems to work in phases. So you have the phase where, like, right, when we're countering, this is what you do. This is this is your first move, whether that be, you know, move forward or just um, catch up with the play. And then there's this sort of very interesting uh, and very attractive kind of ad-libbing quality which kind of appears towards the end of the move. So whether it's, I'm thinking of the Leicester game at the end of last season when they broke from a corner, uh, more headed out, uh, Lothelso played more down the left and then Son vacated space for Kane to run into and score. I think it was the second goal in that game. And you see that all the time. But when you, when you whenever you put talented attacking players together and you encourage them to kind of move into space, you see a like a very creative solution to attacking, attacking situations. And I feel like that's where, obviously, you know, yet yeah, you've mentioned it already, the idea that Marina doesn't really coach attacking football and that his coaching style has been always to um to encourage kind of spontaneity between attacking players rather than kind of like he's not Antonio Conte is what I'm trying to say he doesn't puppet master attacking football uh and that's you know that, that that's very apparent but I think the the benefit of that is you know some, there's some fairly charming attacking football you know counter-attacking play has has a bad name but I think if you look at some of the attacking counter-attacking goals Spurs score it's very attractive football. It's it's an example of players making decisions very quickly. And that's kind of a realization of Mourinho's philosophy in a way. Like that's that's how it's supposed to look, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, I, I'm not going to. Um I think I think what he does is he he manages the transition, but but I think I think to minimize the degree to which the transition is the result of planning and thought and the recognition of strengths is unfair to him as a coach yeah I, I, that I agree with I mean like putting aside kind of what, what I think of the person um, I think the coaching effect is becoming clearer and clearer um, and it's very encouraging like in your notes you've put a little question about whether I think they are genuine title contenders at the moment I'm still going to say no um, purely because I, I think in the base of what happened last season I think um it's a still it's a huge positive to consider them a you know a contender to finish in the top four. I think they're a favourite, one of the favourites probably to finish in the top four now. They look a lot stronger than certainly Manchester United and Arsenal, um, arguably Manchester City too. 
Um, Leicester seem to be not quite what they were last season either. What worries me is, so we talk about like Mourinho's ability to put players in a situation to then make decisions and then to be creative and to, to ad lib a you know a response to a you know attacking situation. My fear with Tottenham is that there are too many individual players who are too important. So if you were to lose Son for any great length of time, if you were to lose Kane, um, which has happened in each of the last four seasons, I think uh, he's had a long injury layoff. Supposedly, uh, Toby Alderweireld is lost for some time. You know. I think Tottenham's ability to withstand those losses is less so than, well, as we're saying, Liverpool's. Liverpool have lost uh, an extraordinary amount of talent from from their from their core, and yet or their, their their rhythm hasn't really changed, and that's hugely impressive. And that maybe Tottenham have the ability to acquire that, but I haven't seen evidence of it yet, and that's probably why I'm kind of um, you know tempering my optimism on that front. Yeah, I think I think it's hard to say because it's this season. I still have a, I'm not going to say that Spurs are going to win the league, but I have a greater degree of confidence in their ability to maintain their form because of the style of football they're playing than I perhaps do with certain of the other big teams. That's as much as I'm willing to say. (laughs) That's as as effusive as you tend to be as a person. So I will take that. Uh, I will recognize your text telling me that we are maybe about to be late to the design meeting and we shall indeed wrap up so um thank you alex thank you seb uh and thank you and there's no um there's no joe so there's no weird ending so i'm just going to stop uh hope you enjoyed it and we shall see you again soon 